Hey, so we're on this, um, this epic road trip type thing, and, and you know, like, like, happy summer to you guys. I'm glad that, that you're here with us. Um, it's just kind of cool to see that you guys intentionalize being here, because summer's not necessarily known as, like, the greatest attendance months for churches, but when you're a family, and, well, it's like this, when, when like, your family made your favorite meal, you made sure to be there, right? Because it was, like, going to be a, there was going to be a moment, because there was something good there. And, and so, you know, like, my prayer is that the presence of God is so good when we get together that you just have to be here, whether it's July or December or whenever it is. And so it's just really cool to see all of you here today and, um, and that you prioritize being here. Um, so that, that's awesome. And so uh, last week I got to uh, uh, preach down at Soulless Church, which is a church that uh, we have a, a great friendship with down in Boca Church Plant that uh, we were able to, to help relationally um, get started. And Andrew's the pastor down there and uh, they're doing great work. Uh, they meet at Don Estridge Church. And so uh, that's where I got to be last Sunday, uh, sharing, sharing the word down there and uh, thankful. And I got to hear Sam's message online, which was super Super awesome. And so if you see Sam, make sure you encourage him. Uh, he seems to like, I don't, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but like preach beyond his years is kind of what I think when, when he preaches. It's like, wow. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So we're on this epic road trip, right? And um, yeah, so I was thinking like, okay, so road trips, and there's lots of stories you can tell about road trips, but there's one story I kind of remember, uh, and it has to do with John O'Brien, I'll mention him again, and Allison, who used to be called Good, who is now called Hicks, who I think is going to be with us, I think next Saturday is like her move-in day, and then they're going to be, be with us, um, and, uh, and so, and so it's, it's pretty cool. I remember, I remember uh, this, this road trip, but I, I feel like, uh, and she asked for prayer on this, so I'm just going to stop. And uh, today is like a transition day for them in their church, Legacy uh, Church uh, in Michigan, where they're saying goodbye. And she had asked for prayer. So it a, it's cool, right? I mean, because I'm the one with the mic, so I guess it's cool if we stop and pray. And um, I just want to stop and pray because that's kind of a, you know, like a, a bitter but also sweet moment, you know, transition. It's not ever easy. And so let's just pray for them. Father, thank you for um, Legacy Church and just their, Allison said, this has been so kind in this transition. God, I'm, I'm thankful for the way that you move people. I think of Abraham even in this series and how, how by faith he moved and how by faith they are moving and following you, God, but it's not easy. And, you know, there's a lot of years of um, family that they're, that they're, especially John, is leaving um, in Michigan. And so, God, I pray your comfort and I pray your everlasting hope to be upon the legacy family and, uh, and the Hicks and that there would be a forever friendship and gospel partnership there, that they would be sent well and say goodbye well, and, uh, and that there would, there would be, in the midst of some mourning, there would be celebration, Father. So would you do all those things uh, as only you can do? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So anyways, I remember this road trip we were on, right? And uh, we went to Jacksonville. We were going up to a, a conference at Tones Church, which is the well. And um, here's, here's what I remember. We each had a job. Because that's, that's the important thing about road trips, right? If, if, if you have a job, then it feels like a road trip. Like somebody's the navigator. Somebody's the unhealthy snack getter. Somebody's the driver. You know, somebody's the complainer. You have, everybody has a role in a, in a like a, a road trip, right? And... Uh, so, so we all had roles, and it was Allison's car, but um, she, wasn't, she wasn't the best with directions, okay? And, and she will be the first to say that. There's nothing hidden there. And so um, the directions were given to somebody else. And I forget if I was driving or she was driving, but, but I, think, I think we maybe had shared roles in that. Uh, but John had a certain role. And if you know John, he's got somewhat of a prophetic voice, right? Like, like he can just call it like it is. And, and here's what I remember about John. And there was this one particular turn we were doing. We were going left. And you know, if you go left, that's usually into oncoming traffic, right? Well, Allison and I both thought we were fine, right? But what we heard John doing was, was um, prophetically playing his role from the back seat. And he said multiple times, we're going to die. We're going to die. <laughs> in that turn. So we're turning, we're like, wow, you know, like, ow, that must be your role. We obviously didn't die. Okay, so he missed that one. Um, but he was certainly playing out his, his role on our, on our road trip. As we look at Hebrews 11, it, it, it seems like, um, like there's different roles that each of these particular people played 
in the redemptive story of God. God's on a journey, if you will, bringing redemption, bringing like rescue and renewal to all of creation. And he's, and he's using different people to do that. And it's like, a, it's like a journey. It's like a road trip, if you will. And, and each person, including yourself and Henry and all of us, we have a different role. Like we do it together, but, but, but we have individual actually callings and, and roles that we play in God's story, which is so awesome. And today we're going we're gonna to look at a guy named Jacob. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to take a look at his role. And, and one of the cool things, and I learned a lot. I'm not, um, the Old Testament isn't, isn't necessarily my sweet spot, right? Like, I, like, give me Jesus and Zacchaeus, and I'm like, yes, Jesus eating with a sinner, I love this. But like Old Testament, I'm like, ooh, that's a little bit, ah, man. I, and so it, it kind of, I feel like it stretches me, and I just kind of go to school when, I'm, well, at least I try to when I'm, when I'm preaching about some of these, these men and women, whoever they might be. And, and so I kind of went to school on Jacob, and one of the cool things that I was learning about Jacob was um, he, didn't, he didn't really do anything of, of worth or of significance. You know, like Abraham moved and Isaac was like the, he was like almost the sacrifice under Abraham. And then it comes to Jacob, and we know a few things which we'll get into here in a minute, but it's not like it was, it, Jacob had a few shining moments along the way where you can cling to that and be like, that was, that was my, that's what I gave to the redemptive story, is I had this amazing moment, and like I can see how God used that. And the commentator was saying, if you feel like you've never had an amazing moment, like, 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 you're not a shining star that's led 16 people to Christ in your workplace and discipled four people over here and you've got all these redemptive... Like, if you feel as though, I mean, you love Jesus, but, but it doesn't feel like you have, like, broken it open in any of your environments, it's like, you know, you're in a great line of, of people who are named as, like, forefathers, heroes of the faith. Like you, like, you don't have to have this huge, significant splash out there for God to use you in simple faithfulness right where you are. And so we're going to look at Jacob and, and kind of how, how he ended and, and how he got there. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 21 is where we're kicking it off today. And um, basically this is, this is the end of Jacob's life that we're looking at, that he does this by faith thing. And then uh, what we're, what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through his life and see how he got there. How was he able to do this? And so um, Hebrews 11 is a chapter all about the people who by faith God used in, in really cool ways to continue his redemptive story. We here at the Avenue Church, we've been talking a lot about Vision 2020 and expecting greater things. Well, the only way that we're going to see greater things, like Jesus makes a promise that we're going to do even greater things than he did, but the activating element in that is faith. As we walk by faith, so do we see the promises of God unfold in really special and unique ways. And so we're looking at some Old Testament people who by faith walked in some of those ways and seeing what God may have to tell us for today. And so um, we, we look here in this particular chapter where um, he's just kind of walking through redemptive history. Where when, when I say redemptive history, what that means is God, um, God saw humanity in its fallen and broken state. I mean, we, we can all at least affirm, you don't have to have too many um, news apps to, to know that the world doesn't work right. right. Like, we could probably all affirm, like, things are not as they should be. No matter what side of the political fence you may be on, no matter what cause you're behind, you can see that when, like, like when, when people have to bury their children, the world's not working right. When people are starving, the world's not working right. When people are being trafficked, it, like, something went wrong. And so God saw that as well. And that, that something that went want, wrong is called sin. And it goes all the way back to our original parents, Adam and Eve. They chose to find life outside of God. And, and then that sin nature, that sin nature came to life in them and it, in a sense come to life in us. So too that we live in a world of sin. But God in his love for us, rather than separating himself from us in our world, which he could have because of his righteousness, he decided to jump into it to get dirty with us and to dwell among us, and that's Jesus, and, and, and Jesus is, is fully God and fully human, and, and, he, and he dwells among us, and he walks in our brokenness, and then he goes to a cross, and on the cross, he takes your sin and my sin, the very thing that should have separated us from God, and, he, and he, he's punished in our place. He dies our death, and on the third day, he overcomes our sin. He overcomes the very thing that would separate us from a holy God for eternity, and he offers us, by faith, 
the opportunity to be forgiven of that sin and ushered into a relationship with God both now and forever. Well, there was a history to that. Jesus doesn't just show up on the scene. That story of redemptive history actually started before Adam and Eve. It was on God's heart. But then it can be traced. There's like a line of redemptive history that can be traced all the way to the person of Jesus. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of the ways that it carried through this particular family line of Abraham, Isaac, and now today Jacob. And so here we come to uh, verse 21 and we read, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith. Okay, so that's not a lot. There's probably, there's probably a lot more that happened there, but there's a couple of things that we see here. So by faith, there's something that, G, that, that Jacob did, and that when he was dying, so we know it's closer toward the end of his life, he blessed each of the sons. Now, I read some commentary on that. And he did give a blessing to all of Joseph's sons, but at least two of the commentators, and I would put myself in this camp, believe that the blessing that he was giving was to these, these um, specific sons where, where um, Jacob actually does a cross blessing, where he blesses the younger when usually the older is the one who gets the blessing. And, and there's a by faith to it because that's not how things were normally done in the Old Testament. Normally, the older son got the, got the blessing, got like the inheritance. But Jacob, when he looks at these two boys of Joseph, he crosses his hands and he blesses the younger one. Why? That's not his own idea, by faith. Because he knew that God was going to do something different that required like grace. And so by faith, Abraham makes this blessing and then he worships over the head of his staff. And so we're gonna see like what, what would that be like to live a life where we might, like by faith, be giving blessings everywhere we go? Well, it, it didn't come easy for Jacob, if you will. And so now we'll, we'll take a look just kind of at Jacob and what you might know. This is what we call like our Yelp version of the particular person, like reviews on Jacob. I don't know what you know um, about Jacob, but a couple of things like that are just kind of good to know uh, before we hop into some of the passages. Um, so it goes Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. He's kind of one of the big three. So when Jesus even references some Old Testament stuff, he'll reference these three guys. These are sort of the three, the three big guys here of, of the Old Testament where God's promised Messiah, the promised Jesus, is, is always related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's like through their line, Jesus is going to come. And, and so Jacob's the third there. And his name, like I don't know what Henry means. I don't know where Henry went, but I don't know what Henry means. But, but Jacob, it, probably better than what Jacob means, Jacob means he deceives. He deceives. So I'm not sure, like, what mom and dad were thinking at that moment, but he deceives is, is what it means. And you may know that. And if you know anything about Jacob, that's kind of what he's known for. He's, he's like a deceiver. And that's how he gets through some of his life. Um, and, and so that's just, that's a reality. And it's kind of good to know um, about Jacob. And uh, he marries Leah and Rachel. So there's this whole story that, you know, I think we'll take a, a moment to look at where he wanted to marry one. And this was a culture where you had multiple wives. And what's interesting is in the Old Testament, this could be a whole other sermon, right? But in the Old Testament, this was part of the culture, but it never works out well. It ne multiple wives never works out well. So you see it in certain Old Testament narratives, but it's never like a flourishing thing. There's usually strife and contention because as you can see in the Genesis account, You've got one man and one woman in the ideal situation. Anyways, this is something that you should know about, about um, Jacob. Um, he is the father of the 12 sons of Israel, and, and that's what his name gets changed to. So the nation of Israel, they've got these 12 tribes. Jacob is the father of the 12 sons that started those tribes. And he has these, um, he has these really significant encounters with God along the way. The presence of God is what makes all the difference in Jacob's life. The presence of God is what makes all the difference in Jacob's life. I was thinking about my own life and thinking about, man, my parents, I'm, I'm sure they did a, a, a lot of things not right. I don't know what they are right now. Some of you are like, you want some dirt on them because you know where they are. Right? You're like, all right, tell me about Don Becky. Tell me about Don. I, don't, I can't even think of them right now. But like, I, I'm sure it was not a perfect parenting situation. 
But one of the greatest gifts they gave me, one of the gifts that I'm sure changed me more than any gift of their parenting um, sort of tenure with me was the gift of presence. The gift of presence. Like they were always there. They rearranged schedules. They rearranged budget. They rearranged careers in order that when I looked up, I could see them. Ministry or the gift of presence. You see, you don't get the opportunity to speak truth and to see change in people's lives if you're not there. Proximity is how you get entrance into people's lives. And that's exactly what we see between Jacob and God, even when things weren't going great. And so um, we're going we're gonna to look at how God showed up in Jacob's life. But so what we'll do is we'll just kind of take a tour of Jacob's life and then we'll, we'll take a look at some of these three encounters that Jacob has with God that, that really changed everything. And so um, here's what you probably want to do now is you probably want to take some notes because uh, we're going to go pretty quick and then we're going to dial down into a few passages here um, in just a minute. And so th this is kind of a road trip of uh, Jacob's life. And so the first stop here is, uh, I'm just calling it, and now listen, so Maybe the seventh grade Bible teacher came out in me a little bit in this moment, okay? But I'm like thinking, Jay, how many, Jacob, what are we going to do? We have everyone here today from people who are like not down with Christ and they're just like have to be here to exploring Christ, to have walked with Christ faithfully, but they're not so sure about where Jacob fits into all this, to people, students who know exactly about Jacob. And I use the term, I felt like I, sh I, felt like I should say this. I used the term uh, two weeks ago, like uh, theology nerd. Remember that? I'm sorry, that came across wrong. Like, like, if you're a theology person who loves theology, that's awesome. You're just probably smarter than me and I didn't just try to be funny. So like, be who you are, okay? That's super awesome. But my point is that we have everyone here and I'm like, how am I gonna teach Jacob? So this is just me, okay? So work with me here. Okay, so the first, the first sort of section of Jacob's life is I'm calling it Jacob Goes to Hollywood. And, and here's, what we know about, here's what we know about Hollywood. In Hollywood, you do what you need to do in order to move up, right? Like I know Hollywood, like I've been there, but whatever. Like, like that's my thought, that's my thinking. You, 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 do, you become whoever it is that you need to become in order to advance your cause. And that's exactly what Jacob does. And we see that here in, Jacob, uh, in Genesis 27. We, we see, we see Jacob like becoming his brother in order to actually steal his brother's birthright. If you're familiar with the story, if you're not, listen to last week's sermon. Sam did an amazing job. But basically, Jacob pretends to be his brother so that he can steal the, birth, the birthright from his dad. And, and in so doing, he creates a lot of family chaos, especially with his brother Esau. Okay? And so now Esau hates Jacob, but Jacob receives the, he receives the blessing. And in so doing, the line is going to be carried through Jacob and not Esau. But his family has, has been left in a lot of chaos. There's a lot of chaos there. And then we move, we move the story forward to Genesis 29, and we see Jacob in New York City. And uh, when Jacob goes to New York City, um, he sort of gets out jacob -ed. Okay, because you know in New York City, it's like, it's like fast times and, and um, if, if you don't know your business or you have some vulnerabilities, they might be exploited, right? And so it's, it's, it's kind of like you either eat or be eaten and Jacob kind of gets eaten up. He gets out Jacob and, and this is the, the, the part of the narrative where he goes to escape his family chaos but while he's there, he sees, he sees um, Rachel and, and he sees Leah and, he's, and there's, like, there's, all these, um, there's all these dynamics happening and, and what happens is there's, they have this father, right? And the father is, his name's um, Laban and, and Laban likes Jacob there. It's, it's like there seems to be blessing around Jacob, so he wants to keep him. So Jacob wants to marry um, one of the ladies, and, and he, like his father does a switcheroo on him. And, and Jacob marries um, the one that he didn't want to marry, and then he wakes up, and you're like, well, first of all, you're like, how did that happen? I don't have time. Sorry, I don't have time. <laughs> it happened, okay? He wakes up, and it's like, wow, where, I, that's not who I 
who I meant to, to marry. And so Laban's like, no, no bigs, no bigs at all. Just work for another seven years and you can now get the one you want. And so he gets, he gets out Jacob, right? He gets kind of like out slimied. And uh, he ends up staying there a very long time. And, and he, he, in the process of that time, though, they're having babies. And we can see that um, the nation of Israel is actually being born, although it's, it's coming in kind of like a, a, weird, a weird way, his, his 12 sons. And uh, anyways, we, we move on from there. And we move into uh, Genesis 33, where Jacob comes home. And Jacob now knows that he's, he needs to go home, and uh, he's on his way home. Uh, he leaves that, that one sort of imprisonment uh, that he had with his father-in-law, and, but he knows he's heading into a situation that's not going to be good. Have you, ever, have you ever gone home and known that home's not going to be good? It's like, man, and, and so um, Jacob's on the, he's on the brink of, of going home, and he doesn't know how his brother is going to respond. But what's really cool in this moment is Esau, he actually, he like sees Jacob and Esau gives us a, like a preview of what the prodigal son's gonna be all about. It's really cool how, how Esau like receives him and, and he forgives him and there's this reconciliation. Jacob doesn't fully trust Esau in this moment, but like, um, you know, it, they're, they're at least working it out and so now Jacob has come home and it's not perfect, there's some skepticism there, um, but you know, like, like they're making it happen. Uh, and, and so we move on in the story and we go to, to uh, Genesis 34 and, and I've titled this Jacob and Hawkins. All right, so some of you are like, oh yeah, like I'm really interested. <laughs> Our youth pastor circled that. He's like, I'm all in for this one, okay? So if you're not a Stranger Things type person, you're like, what does that mean? Basically what you need to know about Hawkins is it's this city where a bunch of crazy, not great stuff happens. And in Genesis 34, sparing you the details, because I'm not exactly sure who's here, age groups and things like that, but there's some like really bad stuff that goes down to Jacob's daughter. And in that scene, it, it goes bad, okay? And so again, taking notes, go through and read it. But you can tell Jacob is a guy who's been, he's kind of experienced a lot along the way. And in 34, like in his Hawkins, it goes really bad, and uh, it goes bad in multiple ways. And so um, that brings us to uh, Genesis 48 and 49. And this is Jacob, and um, he's visiting Orlando. And um, uh, the reason that I say Orlando is because that is the place of dreams for all families, correct? And that's where families go because life's always better in Orlando. Not, not, not really. If you have a kid, you know that. It's not true. But anyways, that was the thought. And so Jacob's in this situation where there's famine and things aren't going well, and so he decides that he is going to go to Egypt because that's where food and sustenance is, and um, actually he meets his son Joseph there, and um, Joseph was one of his sons along the way that, um, you know, he had favored, and then Joseph, we were going to be talking about Joseph next week, so come back if you want to see Joseph's narrative, but they, they get reunited here at the end of Joseph, Jacob's life, and this is uh, where Jacob is able to offer um, some of, the, some of the, the blessing that we talked about uh, by faith. And so this is, this is Jacob's life, okay? This is a lot of scripture in a little bit of time, but this leads us to how Jacob could have been a person who was able to give a blessing by faith. And rather than, than unpack all of sort of the ups and downs of Jacob's life, what we're gonna do is we're gonna unpack the encounters that God has with Jacob. That's what we're gonna do. So if you have your Bibles, this is where we're gonna do a little bit of more of a deep dive, and we're gonna start in Genesis chapter 28. And we're going to see how God's presence meets Jacob how God's presence meets Jacob, how the ministry of God's presence changes everything. And this, this first sort of section is, is the presence of God in our running, in our running, because this is God meeting Jacob when he's on the run. He's... he's sort of tricked his whole family and left them in chaos, and now he's on, he's on his way out. Um, he might have thought God was done with him. I don't know what he thought about where, where God is in this. But God wasn't done with him, even though he was running. So let's read this. Um, 
together here. And, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. All right, so here we see, we see that um, Jacob's not doing well. He's just lied, he's just deceived, he's just won the birthright, but through sort of illegal ways. And he's, he's on the run, as we might be when we find ourselves in sin. He's trying to escape. He's looking for a geographical solution. Anybody do that? You ever think, man, if I can just change my surroundings, that will change everything. But the problem is, you took you there. <laughs> like, like, you were the problem. And so even though it might be better in, I don't know, where does everything get better? It's like Tennessee or North Carolina, whatever. Like one of those places, okay? Well, like you're still you in the Bible Belt and where everybody says ma'am and they drink sweet tea. Like you're still you. And, and so Jacob's learning that, that he can run. He can run. But, but you know what? He's still, he's still Jacob and... I think we see here that as, as we looked at what God has to tell him, God, in the midst of Jacob's running, this is what God has to tell him. I'm, I choose you. I want you. I'm for you, and I'm going to do this thing through you. Like, like, like the, the messianic promise is for you. I know you're running, but I'm, I'm still for you, and I'm going to go where you go. Like, I'm going to... I'm going to keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this promised land, which was part of this big promise that God was going to give his people. They, they were, there was, Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. He was going to get a bunch of land, and the Messiah was going to come through him so he could bless all of the people. Well, Jacob is a part of that family, and Jacob, even in the midst of his running, God's like, I'm going to use you. I've got something for you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. I love this line here. I'll keep you wherever you go. How many of you are enjoying TL? You know what TL is? Toddler life. <laughs> Any, anybody, anybody have TL going on right now? Okay. Here, you don't, you, don't, you don't get a tattoo for it normally. You know, you don't get like the TL, but you have markings. Okay, if you want to know who's, who's walking through toddler life right now, a couple of places to look. Look under their eyes. They're a little bit soft and baggy, okay? Um, look at their clothes. It's usually stained, not from something they spilled. Um, maybe look at their books that they've been meaning to read or their exercise equipment or whatever the case may be. Or maybe look at the people who are like always kind of running and say, I'm so sorry, we're late. Well, like, because I've got all these crazy humans I'm trying to keep track of and like I can barely get myself here on time and now I'm supposed to get that. Toddler life has markings, but one of the markings, one of the things you have to be really good at in toddler life, you got to be quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not kidding. You have got to be quick. Because especially when your toddler gets like two or three or four, I'm not sure when you age out of toddlerhood, but like whenever, like I've got, we got a four-year-old, and here's the deal. If you are not on point with my four-year-old and he decides to go, I'm going to survey, crowd, he'll probably beat 80% of you. <laughs> and those of you who know my family, Paul's back there, he's not, he's, he's super fast. He's super fast. So if you're not like... Like you, and that's why I, can't, I don't love having conversations with my kids after church if there's any kind of moving vehicles around because I'm always like, oh my goodness, yeah, I'll totally pray for you. Okay. And like, I'm playing like defense here because it's like this super weird thing because I know I may have to go into an Olympic sprint to save his life because wherever he runs, I got to beat him there or he's going to die. <laughs> wherever he runs, 
I've got to beat him there or he's going to die. That's what God is saying to Jacob. You can't outrun me, dude. You can try. If you could, you'd die. But wherever you go, I'll be there. My grace will be available. Some of you are running this morning. You're running and you're fast and nobody can catch you. But the voice of the Lord for you is that he's faster and he's here and he welcomes you by his grace. Amen. Quit running, receive Christ. Yeah. Second time that Jacob has an encounter with the living God, um, we, see, we see this, this idea of the presence of God in our struggle. Genesis 32, 28 through 39. The presence of God in our struggle. Now, the first one is our running, okay? And in our running, that means we're running away from God. So when God meets us, his grace to us is, is to say, listen, man, you, we can do this all day, but if you want to experience who I am, you got to quit running and receive my grace. Surrender to Christ. Turn back to me. That's what I mean. When God catches you in, in, in your running, if he's catching you right now, it's like, dude, just stop. You don't need to make it perfect. Just stop and turn to Jesus. Some of us aren't running. We're just struggling. It's just really hard. It's just really hard where you might be. Let's look at what the scriptures have to say uh, to us here in this. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Do I have any more? Is that it right there? Yeah. So the, the whole passage is, is um, uh, Jacob wrestling with God. And, and it's this idea that Jacob is right on the brink of going back to his home. And, and he's at like a crossroads right here. And I loved what I was learning about this particular passage. In this portion of passage, it's not that Jacob was wrestling with God, it's that God was actually wrestling with Jacob. Early in this portion of the passage, it says, and a man wrestled with Jacob. We sometimes think, oh, this is when Jacob got it on with God. Like he wrestled with God, because that's the context. But the truth of the matter is it was actually God who was wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob was responding to it and holding on and asking for a blessing, but it was God who wanted something out of Jacob. It was like Jacob was about to go back, and God's like, you can't go back the same way. Even if I got to wrestle it out of you, even if I got to put hands on you, dude, I, I'm going to wrestle something into you that you don't have yet. And in this, this, this portion of the narrative, they go back and forth, and it says that Jacob, or the, the, that the man, who is later named as God, um, realizes that it's, he's not going to prevail and that there's like, it's just going to kind of go on for a while and it's daybreak and then he, uh, he's ready to go and Jacob's like, I'm not going to let you go unless you give me a blessing. And then the man, or God, as we come to find out later, blesses Jacob in two ways and he gives him a new name and he touches his hip and he gives him a limp. He gives him a new name and he touches his hip I'm seeing um, many of us, including, including myself, it's not that we're running from God, but we've got, we, we have these struggles. It's like things that we've struggled with for years. For me, it's been an anxiousness, just an anxious heart, just trying to stay present and not get caught in worry habits and loops and things that have defined me for years. For you, maybe it's been depression or addiction, or maybe it's been um, faithfulness in your marriage, or maybe it's been with pornography. I don't, I don't know. But it's, it's, not like we're, it's not like we're running. It's not like we're trying to get away from God. It's just, but it's just been a struggle, or maybe it's just even a struggle in the midst of like a, a disease or, or, or a sickness or a difficult time. And here's what God does to Jacob, and I think he wants you to hear this morning, if this is you, 
He gives him a new name, and he says, no longer are you going to be called Jacob, which means he deceives. You're going to be called Israel, which means you, you strove, you, had, you, you went back and forth with me, and you prevailed. Like you, like I'm, like you got what you wanted. And he gets called, he gets a new name. It's like he's, he becomes like a new creation. It's like you're not going to be the deceiver anymore. You're going to be the father of my nation. And then he walks away with a limp, almost like a holy swagger. Like... <laughs> You know, like, no, we think of swagger, and it's like, yo, I got everything on lockdown. I got things on control. Like, like, people look to me because I have it together. But the holiest swagger is when we're super desperate for Jesus, and we know that we've been called by a new name. That is a blessing that can actually turn into something that blesses others. When God meets you in your struggle, and calls you your new name, but causes you to limp after, like, ooh, that hurt. Ooh, yeah, like this side of heaven, I'm going to walk with that, and it's going to be a thing, but it's going to be a thing I can use to give glory to Jesus and help other people with their thing. Well, that's how you might get to a place in your life where you become somebody who's able to bless others by faith. And so I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward and we're going to close in a moment of prayer. And if you're a part of this prayer team, just, just come on up. And um, The final place that God meets Jacob is in um, his obedience. In his obedience, and we don't have time to go into that passage, but basically God meets Jacob when he is, is moving back into the area where God wants him to be. And what God does there is he doesn't give Jacob any new news. He doesn't give him any new information. He just simply reminds him of who he is. And I was, remi I was reminded of how when we walk in obedience, one of the greatest things that God does for us is he gives us reminders of who we are and who he is for us. I can remember I was... Um, We're in Tampa, and we had decided to go to a, a preseason baseball game, and we had decided to take one of our little guys with us. It was actually for one of our older kids, and anyways, we were at a table, and we had gone into a restaurant, and in the restaurant, we were like, man, this is a yellow flag restaurant. I think, I forget if it was Applebee's or Ruby Tuesday's, because if you go into those restaurants, you know they're not super toddler friendly. It's not like Chili's where it's really loud, and your toddlers can be full on. It's like they have people there who might look at you like, why are you here? So we had that, like, we knew that. And then our toddler was just being our toddler. And I remember looking around us being like, oh, man, like, you know, just, ah, we're, we're messing up another situation. We're making other people's lives a mess. We're inconveniencing them. You know, I don't know why. I just hate that. I hate when, when, like, we bring chaos to people. And so I can remember looking around, being super subconscious. My wife and I were like, man, we're just worn out. Probably thinking, why did we bring the little guy with us? And then this lady came over. And, and she came over and she was just like, she bought our dinner. And she was like, basically just encouraging us. Like, hey, way to go. Like, it just felt like the Lord was saying, in your obedience, I, I, I want to remind you that what you're doing is a good thing. And so some of you might just need to be reminded that what you're doing is a good, good thing. Whatever your obedience looks like. And so I'm going to call for prayer now, and I'm going to actually lead the moment, but we've got people here that, that want to receive you. And so if you're a person who's been running and, and you want to welcome God into your running and actually quit that and, and, and start, start following Christ the way that he's called you to, I'm going to invite you to come forward. If you're a person in a struggle, if you're a person who's in the midst of a struggle and, and you're like, man, I need the presence of God to speak to me now. I need to, I need to be reminded of my new name. I, I need to... I need to know how to, how to continue to walk through this faithfully. Then come forward. And if you're a person who's just been in obedience, but it's like, it's just a grind. You just need a fresh word, a fresh encouragement from the Lord. I'm just going to ask you to come forward now. And so just get with one of our people who, who would want to pray for you, and I'm going to lead our moment. Um, I'm going to give you a second to think about if that's you or not. We believe in the power of prayer. And so we'd love to invite you to receive some prayer.
So, so let's all pray together. Father, I thank you for those who have come forward. I pray that you would, your presence would meet them right where they are. God, that your presence would, would remind them that they don't have to run any, any, any longer, that your presence would remind them that they have a new name in Christ, that your presence might remind them that it's a good thing, their obedience, and to keep going. Father, we're believing that you, even in this moment, would, would make that prayer a reality in their hearts and in their minds. And I pray this name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, would you stand? If you're, if you're being prayed over, just continue to be prayed over. I'm going to dismiss us. We're going to have some music in the background, but I want to dismiss all of us with a benediction. So would you stand and receive the benediction? Now, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and may he give you his peace. And may his presence meet you in your running and in your struggle and in your obedience, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.